it's it's just that is absolutely a game. It's just you know every day is different. There's always obstacles. You're trying to figure things out. Um, I think I always was kind of like that, and I just have like this this like passion for it and this these goals for myself, like where I want to take these brands in the future. Um, and when you have that as kind of like your north star and leading you, you just do whatever it takes to figure it out. You know, if I told you right now, hey guys, like you got to find a way to you know make a beverage brand by the end of the month, or you know you're gonna be homeless, or you know you know we're gonna hurt your family members or something extreme, you're gonna figure it out. You know, and so I think having that in you of like you're just gonna do whatever it takes to figure it out it is uh you know beneficial i think that's kind of where everything came from tyler welcome in thank you boys appreciate you having me on you brought some gifts too <laughs> we did we did we did uh brought the celly and the wake up water so maybe some cellies tonight wake up water to help you to recover in the morning I like that in tandem. Was that like the thought process or did, they, did that just happen over time? It kind of just happened over time, honestly. Wake Up Water was the first company that I started. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big coffee drinker, but I live a pretty active lifestyle. I like to work out. I'm busy. So I, I needed a pick-me-up. I just felt so tired all the time, but I didn't like coffee and I didn't want to go towards these unhealthy energy drinks. So you had the Monsters Red Bulls out there that are loaded with all these unwanted sugars and, and calories. And if they don't have those things, they're pretty artificial. So I want to create a truly better for you, you uh, energy drink. And then once that started, everybody was coming up to me saying, hey, you're going out all the time. You know, you love the bar scene. Why don't you come up with an alcohol brand? Because you already know how to make beverages. And to be honest, I didn't have the time or the money to start another brand. And so I approached my dad and my brother and I said, hey, guys, if you help set the, you know, if you help provide some upfront capital, if you can do some of the day to day sales and marketing, I'll do all the rest. I'll set up the beverage. I'll, I'll formulate it. I'll get you know contact our, our manufacturers and distributors. Uh, so now we're all doing it together. So that's kind of how that second one came came about. What's well, like your background? Did you go to college? Did you tell us your story about that? Yeah. So I went to Holy Cross okay. uh, in Worcester. Uh, it's a small liberal arts school, so there's really uh, no business. You know, what we, was your major? There? I did economics. Okay, that's what so, I was doing. College. Yeah. So like close enough, but I mean. The stuff you're learning in economics, it doesn't translate really to the real world as much. Like, you know, some greater macroeconomic trends, I guess, do. Uh, but when it comes to running a business, you know, not really. So um, I graduated uh, from Holy Cross in 2017 and knew I wanted to start my own company, but didn't have the money. So I went and worked at a tech company uh, in the seaport, actually. Did some sales for them, um, knew, knowing all along that I wanted to start my own company. And so... Worked there for like a year and a half, two years, saved up as much money as I possibly could and was kind of laying the groundwork for Wake Up Water as I was doing that. And as soon as it was ready to go, I left, you know, the company and uh, went in full time to it. Where well, did the idea come from for Wake Up Water originally, other than the fact you don't really like coffee? Yeah, that, that was honestly the main reason, you know, why I started it. I just, I didn't really like coffee. Um, I needed some sort of healthy pick-me-up and saw the opportunity. I knew that I wanted to start like, some company didn't really know what I wanted to start exactly, um, but I always found myself really into food and beverage. So like I'm really weird. Like if I go to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, you know whatever, I'll like walk down the aisle and if I see a new product that I haven't seen before, I'll literally go and you I'm know, taking the check pineapple because there's a pineapple shortage. Well, so there's pineapple, oh, so pineapple got... of the celly, of the celly. Oh, okay, um, okay. With wake up water, we got lemon, orange, mango, coconut, and citrus. All right. We'll yeah, it, citrus we'll is pretty fire. I like that one. And you started, so this was the second product, right? Wake that up was, water's first. Oh, this and was, then celly came second. But this was different. This used to be different. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so wake up water actually started with a, a bottle. Okay. Uh, and so we were selling that for only a few months because we launched it right as COVID was hitting. And so all these stores that were taking us on were like, hey, look, we got to wait a little bit, figure out COVID, you know, let's let's get that sorted before we take on your product. And I had produced all this inventory. So I was scrambling. I put all my money into this. I sold my car to start this business. So uh, that was kind of a pretty you know stressful time. But then, you know, we, we kind of took about a year and reformulated and made it into it to this product today. And, you know, it was honestly the best thing I ever did. What? So like growing up, like obviously you went to college, you yeah. studied economics, like were you entrepreneurial growing up or is there like a time that you were like, I want to start a business or like, 
was it after you kind of experienced the corporate world and like yeah. experienced that where you're like, eh, this is not really for me. Let me see what else is out to there. To be honest, like ever since I was little, I mean, I used to go, I don't know if you guys remember those like creative erasers that you could put on your pencils. They were like race cars and basketballs. So I used to have my mom buy a bunch of those and I would go into school and sell them. Um, you know, at recess, everybody would come to my desk and I would, you know, be dealing them out. You know, I used to sell Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you know, all, all sorts of things, lemonade stands. I was always doing stuff to make money, shoveling walkways in the, in the, in the winter. So I was always very entrepreneurial and knew I wanted to start something. I didn't know it was going to turn into beverage, but I just knew at some point I wanted to start something. Where and then did that, go ahead, where you, did that ambition come from? I think we're going to ask the same thing. I, I think. Like, Honestly, it was just something I, I had in me. And then also my grandfather was an entrepreneur. So he had a warehousing and trucking company in Massachusetts. And uh, his his father passed away when he was in high school. So he had to drop out of high school and just start, you know, building the business. And that was how he made a living. And he ended up building into something that was, you know, pretty special. Um, so I saw that at a very early age and was really motivated by that. And I was like, that's what I want to do when I grow up. So you didn't know it was going to be a beverage you didn't like, um, what, were, were there any other, like other industries or that you were looking at? Like when you decided that, okay, I'm, I want to start a business. I want to start like yeah. a product. Did it happen to do with like passions or hobbies yep. of yours? Cause you mentioned you like to go out, you like to yep. do things. Talk about like that process and like choosing this or were there other options? Yeah. So there definitely were other options. I have like a running notes tab in my phone that just has, hundreds of different possible business ideas, you know, it's things that are crazy and then things that are kind of more reasonable. And uh, I think what it came down to was picking something that I actually enjoy because, you know, as you guys know, doing the content stuff, I mean, in the marketing stuff, like it's so hard and it requires so much work. If you don't love it, you're just going to get burnt out and, and give up. So out of all those ideas that I was sifting through, I was like, what's something that I would use every day that I could really benefit from, that I could benefit other people uh, from creating and something that I can really get up every day and feel motivated to do. And that's when I arrived at, at these. No, I really like this, honestly. I just tried it for the first time and I like it because it's not uh, carbonated. Yeah. Like, a lot of times I don't like, you know, like soda drinks because of the bubbles. Yep. I can get through it on beer and stuff like that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, on your seltzers, but, yeah. um, I don't like bubbles. So that's why I steer away from yeah. most traditional energy drinks. hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and we kind of took, you know, liquid IV, I feel like really made the stick packs popular. Uh -huh. And once they started to have a lot of success, we looked at that saying, you know, we can just make our product in a stick pack. Like people are okay with this format. They like taking it on the go with them. It's easy to ship across the country. So it works for us. Um, and you bring up the carbonation. That was a, another huge thing, just the bubbles. Um, so this, you know, you can actually add this to a seltzer water and get that carbonation. But I typically just kind of throw it in a water bottle like you guys. The carbonation, though, is a good good uh, segue because with Selly, that was a big thing we were seeing in the seltzer category. We were seeing all these seltzers come out that were so overly carbonated. You have a few of them, you feel bloated, you feel gross. So what we did was like, okay, we want to keep carbonation because that gives the product a little bit of a refreshing taste to it. But let's lower it to the point where, you know, it's just enough and you're not going to feel overly bloated by having a few of them. So that, that carbonation is a really big thing that we definitely were, were mindful of when we were formulating. What was your first step in business? So like you, you come up with an idea, like how did you just take action like from yeah. day one and then like continue to take action and kind of, you know, play in the course? Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's kind of some stepping stones and kind of like, you know, parts of the process. So you come up with the products, you have this idea in your head, you reach out to a beverage manufacturer who can actually start to put this thing into a physical product. So start starting with coming up with the product though, it's like there must have been like other ideas like yeah. out there. There must have been like, you know, a bunch of like ideas written down on the whiteboard that you crossed out 100%. and you came up with this. Like what were some of those other things or like how yeah. did you come up with the first? Yeah. So the first product was the bottle product, like we were saying. Mm -hmm. I just think it's it's really fun to just be able to grab something off the shelf and, and drink it. So we had the bottle and uh, we were trying for so long to come up with this like natural product that had no preservatives um, and all these things. And it was really hard in the bottle format. But what I started to realize when I was formulating is I would love to put more stuff in wake up water, you know, whether it be amino acids, you know, more electrolytes, more vitamins, all these things, maybe some immunity help. But what happens is you start to formulate it and you realize maybe some ingredients don't work well together. It doesn't taste right. Or maybe you're starting to price it out and you're saying, wait, this is going to cost me too much money and I will have to charge some astronomical price to the consumer and that won't work out. So you're right. I mean, it was kind of a drawing board thing. And what we came down to was let's create a very simplified version 
of having a natural energy and hydration boost. What does that entail? Let's put some natural caffeine. Let's get electrolytes. It's going to be vitamins, uh, but really kind of keep it at that and not just throw the kitchen sink at it. Okay. So, so then, you know, going, bringing that idea to a manufacturer, like what did that look like? Yeah. So it was essentially me kind of having the concept saying, you know, here's what I want in it. Here's what I don't want in it. Like we don't use sugars. We don't use artificial ingredients. So that was a big thing for us was like, we're not formulating with that. Here's what we need. And they essentially, you know, put the product together and they'll ship you some samples. So once they ship you some samples, you're testing it out. You're getting some friends and family over to try it out. And you're just kind of critiquing it. You're saying, this is too sweet. This isn't flavorful enough, whatever it is, providing them the feedback. And then they'll come back with more samples. Um, and you kind of just keep that iterative process going until you're complete. Did you feel like, how, like you're not an expert in food and beverage, no, God, right? God, no. So it's like <laughs> at that time, like how did you feel critiquing the product when yeah. like, you're just kind of going by like what you think is right and what your friends think is right. To be honest, it's actually really hard. Like when you drink something, you know, if you're drinking something out there in the market, you can tell all this, I like it or I don't like it. But when you bottle down like, okay, here's a product, I'm going to critique it. It's really hard to put your finger on like what you're looking for. So I'll end up using phrases like, oh, I want this to taste more full or things like that. And the beverage formulator is smart enough to know, like, I don't know how to achieve that, but they'll know, okay, this is something we've heard before, more full. That translates to more citric acid or, or whatever the, the ingredient is. So yeah, I'm no expert at all, but that's why it's important to find a good formulator because they can help you through that whole process and hold your hand and you can just tell them your vision and they can help bring it to life. How many iterations did it take like to find the one? It, it took a lot. I mean, we were probably with wake up water, maybe 12 to 15 and that's on the bottles at first right yeah so that's on the bottles and then you're right then we had to reformulate for this the stick pack and the powder product and that probably took another 10 or so um it was a little bit easier because we were kind of stripping away the liquid and then we kept all the ingredients the same we just wanted to figure out you know what your use levels of each that we were going to need so once we had that the bottle it was a little bit easier to kind of go from there what did you learn like you know obviously the bottles the timing, everything, the market, it, it didn't really work out, right? Yep. What did you learn from like that business and starting, that was your first business, mm-hmm. right? And like really taking a bet on yourself with your family as well yeah. to, you know, transition that into two other, well, you know, you kind of transitioned that into a similar, the same product, yeah. um, but then starting another, you know, company as well. Yeah. Um, what did you learn from the first thing that gave you confidence in the next? Yeah, ventures? I think there's a few things, right? It's like once you've done something, you're just naturally better at it. You know, you, you've gone through the process, you know what to do, you know how the process goes. So you're quicker and you're just better at it. And you're able to avoid some of those mistakes early on, like overpaying for certain things. You realize that you can negotiate everything. So if somebody's quoting you something for ingredients, you can negotiate, so you can save money. Um, the one really big eye-opening thing, though, was how expensive it is to ship canned and bottled liquids across the country. It is so expensive, and that's why I think I feel so blessed that I, I stumbled into the stick packs because it opens the door for us. Because if we were shipping bottled liquids across the country, I mean, for example, we were selling 12 packs of the bottles, and we would go and people would buy from New York. Just to ship from Boston to New York, it was like $25. And so you think about it, you're like, okay, $25 just to ship. You have to charge that to the customer plus the cost of the goods, plus you want to make some money. I mean, you're going to have to charge $45, $50 when you're operating at such a small scale. So I think that insight was really important because it helped me with my current wake up water version of the product. It also helped me with Selly because now I know going in, hey, I got to do a better job, you know, sourcing ingredients at a cheaper rate. I need to source cans at a cheaper rate. I need to find a manufacturer who can kind of give us enough scale early on where we can ship this across the country and we can make money doing so. Talk about like the Selly, like, cause you ended up continuing to do that with Selly. So like, you're kind of like contradicting yourself, but like you did take some of the learning, like the learning lessons from, Mm -hmm. you know, shipping and whatever like else to be able to make this, you know, successful. Yeah. And you're right. I still went into it. So I always tell people I'm crazy because I went into like the two hardest spaces, like energy drinks and alcohol, the two most competitive spaces. But it goes back to, again, like what you enjoy doing. Like I just love doing it. We were just talking about Moxie's earlier. Like we just got selling into Moxie's. So 
I love going there and, and grabbing a celly and having some food and being out there and meeting people, talking to people. So I just kind of follow what I enjoy doing. But you're right. I mean, it, it's a really tough business model. And I think the mindset with Selly is you just have to get to scale. And, you know, we're going to have to raise some capital to get there for Selly because, you know, we're not making any money on the product initially. You know, we're losing money when, we, when we're really, you know, factoring in everything. You factor in the cost of the product, marketing operations, distributors taking their cut. Um, you know, it's a really tough business model. And that's why you see so many brands come and go. But our business model is such that we're keeping it so consolidated in the Boston area, in the New Hampshire markets. So it's really just Massachusetts and New Hampshire right now. And that's intentional so that every dollar we're spending on marketing goes further. Every can that we're selling goes further. And it really has that that concentrated feel and, and strategy behind it. Um, but you're right. Still a very, very tough business model. Was that your intuition or did someone tell you to, to stay focused on this area? So yeah, definitely other people like, and that's the thing too, even now, like these businesses are still fairly small, like all things considered. And so I'm a sponge. I'm constantly learning from people, constantly seeing people have a lot of success and saying, okay, what have they done that really worked for them? And the one thing that I've heard time and time again from the people that have really made it is start in your backyard and just hammer it. So even like Sam Adams, for example, when Jim Coke was starting uh, the Boston Beer Company, he would just go around to bars and just and just sell Sam Adams. And he just hammered that market so hard where it became like a homegrown brand and people got behind it. So um, it, it's this concept of going deep versus wide. So just consolidate all your efforts and focus all your efforts on one geographical region because it makes everything that much easier. Word of mouth spreads faster. You know, your cost of goods are going down because you're distributing to one area. Your marketing efforts go further because now you're marketing to one area instead of 10. And that's the biggest mistake I see beverage founders make or, or really founders in general is they try to do too much early on. They don't have the money. They don't have the team behind them or the bandwidth to expand into these new markets, but they try to do it anyway. And so now you're selling Selly in 10 different states and I'm flying around like a crazy person trying to sell product, market the product, and you don't build up that density or that that following in any of the states. That's definitely one of the biggest things I feel like founders and like entrepreneurs like just get wrong is like trying to bite off way more than they can 100%. chew or like try to do too much. Mm -hmm. And like whether that's you or yourself you with your team or yeah. with your product like 100%. you have to like really like solve one problem and like do one thing at a time and absolutely. i think like you, having that mindset definitely helps you oh absolutely even with wake up water like I'm so into like the health and nutrition space. I would love to have a protein bar or a protein powder or, you know, a pure hydration blend or, or whatever it is. Um, but I'm realizing, you know, you got to stay focused on one thing because now you start, you know, taking your eye off the prize. Like Wake Up Water, you know, it's a decent sized business now, but it's really small in the grand scheme of things. Like it's nowhere near Liquid IV or Gatorade or some of these massive beverage brands. So there's so much room to grow. And if you take your eye off the prize and you kind of start taking your foot off the gas with this product, it's gonna plateau and you're gonna start something else from scratch, which is hard. And you're just gonna plateau again and you're gonna keep doing that. So there's this idea of the power of compounding where all of your efforts really start to pay off over time. Has Wake Up Water, have you taken like a similar approach where like you wanna keep it regional or because it's such a small profile. You could ship it across the country for yeah. less than probably 10 bucks. Exactly. Like, are you kind of expanding more nationally on that? Yeah. So we ship all across the country on our website and on our Amazon. Um, we don't sell in stores. So it's kind of a, they're both kind of two different business models, right? It's like Selly's only in stores and then in bars and wake up waters only on, on online. Um, so we are shipping nationally for wake up water. However, some of our marketing efforts definitely are a little bit more like concentrated in certain areas. So we're based in Boston. So we obviously do a lot of work in Boston. We do events, work with influencers, um, even just like paid advertising uh, on social media. Uh, and then also we find hot spots where, where wake up water does well. So it does well like in Texas and Florida, Ohio is another big one for us. And so we know we have that data. And so now we double down on that and we kind of put more resources towards those those regions because again, we are still a smaller brand. We only have so many resources. And so if we have X amount of dollars to spend on marketing, you're better you know, spending it on a you know, concentrated area to really get, make sure you get those returns. What do you think the catalyst was like in those markets? They're very specific. You said Ohio, Texas, et Yeah. Et to be honest, I don't know. I really have no insight. I mean, I guess something like Florida or Texas maybe it's warm year round. People are a little bit more active, you know, in Boston, you know, it's cold for half the year. So people aren't, you know, as active, aren't working out as much, aren't going outside. So I think that may be what is, you know, what's going on with Florida and Texas. 
random places like Ohio or Tennessee or even New York that sell well for us, I, I couldn't tell you. I think it's just for whatever reason it latched on and a lot of our customers are there and enjoying the product and hopefully telling their friends and family about it. Is Amazon like a bigger sales channel on in those markets? Yeah, so that that is a really interesting strategy that we took. So at first I was pretty anti Amazon because I was like, you know what? I want to, you know, know every customer that's buying. I want to control that customer journey. I want to have the data so I can remarket to them. However, everyone kept saying like, man, you got to get this on Amazon. Like it's so much easier. I would buy so much more frequently. And so I was like, you know what? Let's, let's try this out. And sure enough, it just took off. I mean, Amazon will do anywhere from between, you know, 85 to 90% of our sales uh, is just on Amazon right now. And it's because it's so easy. And I thought about it, you know, you want to be where your customer is, right? So, you know, trying to force them to come to my website and buy is a, it can be a big ask. And so I think about the products that I buy protein bars or protein powders, supplements on Amazon. I never go to the brand site. Like, you know, even Bear Wells, for example, that's a big Trader Joe's brand right now. That's, you know, doing well protein bar wise. I'll buy them online or I'll buy them at Trader Joe's. Like I'll never go to their website and buy, you know? So I think meeting the customer where they are is really important. Uh, and that's why, you know, we, we are happy that we made that decision to go on Amazon and continue to push our efforts there. When you made that decision, was it like immediate change or did it take a little bit? It, it, it took a little bit to kind of see the power of it. And then also there was an iOS update with, with Facebook and, and uh, Apple. And Oh, so that was like 2021 yeah, when you did that? Yeah, exactly. So, Wait, and you got on Amazon before the update? So we we were testing it out, but we okay. weren't really full-fledged on there. Oh, yeah, that's good. And then that, that update hit, and we were seeing our cost per acquisition go through the roof. And we're like, this isn't a viable business anymore. Like, you know, we're paying $50, $75, $100 dollars to get a customer to buy a $20, $25 item. That doesn't make sense for anybody. So as soon as that was happening, we're like, look, let's go on Amazon. Let's really start to figure this out. And what's nice about Amazon is people are there to shop. They're already there to buy something. With Amazon ads, or, or I mean, excuse me, Instagram ads, people are, are just scrolling. They're looking to be entertained. They're checking in on their friends. They're just mindlessly scrolling. It's really hard. There's a lot of friction into getting them to stop scrolling, to take a look at the product, go onto your website, read more about your product, be convinced to buy, enter their credit card information, their shipping information, and then buy it. Whereas Amazon, it's you click a button, you add to the cart, they handle the rest. And, and it's it at your house. And so it's removing that day. friction. Exactly. <laughs> and the shipping is also great. People can get the product in a day or two. You know, yeah. it, it, it just really changes things. So I always tell people now, I go over in the reverse. I say, you know, when you're first starting a brand, build it first on Amazon and then have it funnel into your, your website. You can use your website almost as like a club store, like a, like a Costco or BJ's, where you can come on to wake up water, a drinkwakeupwater.com, and you can buy four or five, six packs of it and, and get a huge savings on it. That's kind of how we view it now is like Amazon, you want a pack or two, quick, easy, go get it there. If you wanna buy in bulk, save some money and you're a big fan of it, come to the website and buy. When you do start on Amazon though, like with either a new product or an existing product, how do you stand out? Because it's so competitive. It is, it's really, really difficult. Um, you know, I think one is, is is content and creative. Like as you guys know, you guys do a great job in, on the marketing side of things. So you know that that is obviously a big, you know, kind of factor in, in the whole process. Um, but secondly, it's really just ad buying. So somebody will come on and they're looking for a healthy energy drink. And it's, can we serve wake up water up to that customer? Have them click on it. And then that's when the creative takes over. They start to educate themselves. Reviews play a big part in it as well. So we have like over 1100 reviews at this point, um, you know, hopefully getting that number even higher. And people love that social proof of like, oh, I like this product. Um, and between all those things, that's kind of how you start to build. And then when people like it, they come back and buy again. And that's really where you build your business out is when you can capture those repeat buyers. That is really where things start to snowball because you're just carrying over all of that existing revenue into the next month. And uh, that's when things get pretty exciting. What percentage of your buyers like are become repeat customers? So right now it's almost 40%, which is, which is really high. I think in our space, you're probably looking at 18 to 20 percent um now it's a bit skewed because we are a lot smaller than some other brands so if some other brands are doing 100 million dollars a year they obviously need a lot more repeat customers to keep that same percentage um but you know i think it's a testament to the product being you know pretty decent it works well um you know i'm a little biased but pe people like it and so um we're, we're, we keep know. drinking it yeah well, you guys are nice buzzing by the end yeah of i'm good i'm like <laughs> locked in right now today so wait tell, tell us too like tell us too like what's in it like what's about i see the ingredients yeah. list 
it's literally two lines. Exactly. Like, yeah. So we you don't really see that too often. Exactly. And you'll notice that if you take a stick pack, you'll see how light it is. And that's intentional. We didn't want to put fillers in there. Yeah. I was like, did I put the whole thing yeah. in already? <laughs> exactly. I was like, what? So it's really just 175 milligrams of natural caffeine, which is that's a, a little lot. bit less. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, but it's like less than like a Celsius. Celsius is yeah. 200. Rain and even Bang used to have 300. So if you get like a medium coffee from a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks, you're looking at probably 220. So it's a little bit less than that. Mm -hmm. And we picked that number because not everybody has the caffeine tolerance that some of us have. So mm -hmm. I can have a medium coffee, not really feel anything. So I might need two wake up waters, but I didn't want to create a product where if somebody is very caffeine sensitive, they couldn't have it. So we don't really want the jitters or anything like that. So it's 175 milligrams of natural caffeine. There's electrolytes. So the same electrolyte levels as the leading sports drink. There's also B vitamins for some added focus and energy. And then there's the flavor and, and that's it. There's really no added ingredients. You know, you look at a lot of these products out there and, you know, you read the ingredients and there's all these artificial things and sweeteners and, and, and fillers. And when you look at wake up water, it's, it's really just as simple as that. And we wanted to keep it that way. Yeah. looks, I mean, looks, looks pretty legit. What, um, like what legal loopholes do you have to jump through, um, to bring like an energy drink to market? Um, like do you have to get it approved by the FDA or talk about that process? So it's actually really funny and this might surprise people with supplements. You actually don't need them to be approved by the FDA, which I don't even know if I love even being in the space. Like I, I, I think it's interesting, right? Like you so have all these, stop some, sorry to talk over you. Yeah, no, what's no. it going to like stop somebody from just bringing one of these to market and putting a bunch of shit into it? Or is it not? there's really not much there. I mean, people can do it. And that's what's kind of scary. That's why I think it's so important with supplements to really look at the ingredients, turn that label around and figure out what's in it because there are no FDA regulate, regulatory, you know, bodies that are looking over this stuff. Um, you know, so people can even make a lot of claims that, you know, might not be true. So it's really important to, to look at that. Um, ideally, you know, because Amazon so big, because social media exists, you know, I, I think if somebody was creating something that was, you know, really bad, the word gets out and, you know, ultimately doesn't end well for them. But in terms of, of wake up water, we worked with like an FDA compliant facility. Um, our manufacturer has a ton of certifications to make sure that, you know, the facility making the product is, is clean, is up to par and all the standards and, and safety and regulations. So we take added steps to make sure that that's the case. But yeah, it is, it is a bit of the wild west in the supplement world. I feel like at that point too, though, it's like survival of the fittest. It's yeah. like if, if you're not doing things right, like there's so much competition. 100%. And like the next guy is just going to be up and like 100%. the next guy is you with this, you know, F, like a factory that's all certified. Mm -hmm. Everything's like mm -hmm. you've dotted your I's, yeah. cross your T's and like, you know, you're ready. You're ready to take it oh, on. Absolutely. So pe people are smart. Like yeah, 100%. You, like you're saying. 100%. So. Yeah, people do catch on and it's funny, like customers, it's tough. Like, you know, sometimes they're really smart and they catch on to things and sometimes they actually, you know, are maybe misinformed or they, they kind of are confused about something. So one of the things that we dealt with um, was we use a natural sweetener called Stevia and it comes from a leaf. It's a, it's a, it's a natural sweetener, um, which is great because it, you know, doesn't have any, you know, calories and, and uh, it is natural. But people get confused uh, with Stevia and Splenda because Splenda is an artificial sweetener. And uh, that isn't so great for you. And so we had a lot of people early on buying the product being like, we hate that there's an artificial sweetener in the product. And it's like so frustrating. It's like, no, there's not an artificial sweetener. You're mixing the two up. So uh, it's important to, you know, educate the customer, make people very aware of what's in your product and, and why it might be the way it is. And, you know, maybe educate them on, on terms of maybe they're confusing two things in this regard. What about running two different beverage brands? So like one's an alcohol, one's a better for you product. Mm -hmm. How do those part work together? Do you have cross branding? Do you keep them completely separate? Yeah. Personally, day to day. Talk, talk about that. Yeah. So I keep them separate, you know, legally. I keep them separate in terms of ownership. So um, I was speaking about my brother, and my father. They're both involved in the, in the alcohol brand, whereas I'm the only owner of Wake Up Water. So it's a little separate in that regard. Um, but then in terms of the day to day, it really is like what brand needs me the most in that given moment. So, you know, we were just talking about beforehand uh, production runs. I'm, I'm trying to do both production runs right now. Wake Up Water is going a little bit smoother. Selly right now, we have a mango pineapple flavor and there's a pineapple shortage in the world right now. It's a global pineapple shortage. So one of those like classic cliche moments in entrepreneurship where you're throwing a curveball and you got to figure it out. And so this week I've been on the phone with, my God, probably 50 to 100 
different ingredient suppliers saying, hey, do you guys have this pineapple juice concentrate that we need? Like we need this for this month. We're doing a production run later this month. We need it now. And everybody's coming to you saying, hey, look, we, we're out of stock. We don't have it. We don't know when we're getting it in. And you just start frantically reaching out to a bunch of people. And you luckily, see you at Trader Joe's just running yeah, through the running aisles, through the grabbing aisles. all the pineapple juice. Exactly. <laughs> but what's funny is you act, we actually need like a specific type. So it, it just is another one of those things you don't even realize going into it. Like there's a thousand different pineapple juices de depending on, you know, if it's clarified or unclarified, how, you know, much the brick, how high the bricks level is, you know, where it's coming from in the world. Like it's going to taste different. So there's a lot of different nuances to, to ingredients that you don't really realize. And I think, you know, on the day to day, like I said, it really comes down to what brand needs me more and no day looks the same. It's, it's, I'm doing production runs today. Next week, I'll probably be diving a lot more into our marketing campaigns for the rest of the year. You know, we're onboarding a new distributor for Selly. And so, you know, the next month or so will be a lot of work with that. But then when that's done, it's okay that your time is now free to do other things. So it just really is w whatever comes up. Talk about awesome. learning like an industry or like a space or just like a whole, like you're learning supply chain. You're learning all these like crazy like ingredients where, where you had no you know background yeah. in while doing it. Yeah, I mean, no background at all. And like, I am not the smartest guy in the world. Like I'm the first person to say that. I think I'm decently street smart. But if you ask people that were, you know, classmates with me in college, they'd be like, he wasn't the best student. Uh, but when it comes to like starting something, the biggest thing with entrepreneurship, I think, is being able to pivot and being able to learn on the fly and being able to be kind of self-sufficient because nobody's holding your hand through this process. Like you're in it alone. Maybe you have a co-founder, maybe you don't, but even if you do, they typically don't know what to do either. And so it really comes down to just like piecing things together as you go, Googling things, YouTube. Like I learned Facebook and the Amazon ads right off YouTube. Um, you know, supply chain stuff. You're just kind of like talking to manufacturers. You're talking to other brands. And what's nice about this space is the food and beverage uh, industry. It's very like, you know, friendly. People are very willing to help each other. So I have people reach out to me all the time and asking, Hey Tyler, you know, what's your advice on this? What's your advice on this? And I always kind of pay it forward because people have helped me too. And they continue to. So, you know, it's just having that ability to just like figure it out and, and, and just learn, you know, is that like how you kind of always were like, just like, I mean, people, entrepreneurs, everybody always says like business is a game. Yeah. Like it, it yeah, is. Right. It is. And yeah, you absolutely. feel like that every single day when you're like, you don't have a set schedule you have you just have to scramble and figure it out you know i'm sure you have different like sops from like one brand that you can move to another yeah. but it's like you you still got to like figure it out and like 100%. play that game and, and run into obstacles yeah it, it's just that is absolutely a game it's just you know every day is different there's always obstacles you're trying to figure things out um i think i always was kind of like that and i just have like this, this like passion for it and this, these goals for myself, like where I want to take these brands in the future. Um, and when you have that as kind of like your North star and leading you, you just do whatever it takes to figure it out. You know, if I told you right now, Hey guys, like you got to find a way to, you know, make a beverage brand by the end of the month, or, you know, you're going to be homeless or, you know, you know, we're going to hurt your family members or something extreme. You're going to figure it out, you know? And so I think having that in you of like, you're just going to do whatever it takes to figure it out is uh you know beneficial i think that's kind of where everything came from what was the state of like the business that um wake up water was in when you started sally like were yeah. things going pretty smoothly with it and you felt confident you could start another endeavor or yeah. were you kind of like rough waters yeah saying, that's it? that's a good question i mean I, I think it was on its two feet it was growing nicely but it certainly by no means was like enough for like me to retire off of mm -hmm. or anything like that uh, and that's, you know, hence why I needed my brother, and my father to come in and provide some capital to start it. Cause I didn't have that laying around. Um, I think, you know, it was at a point though, where I had some people on my team that were helping me. Like I have a full team that helps me with my Amazon. I have a full finance team now that helps me, you know, with the finances of the business. And so I definitely had a little bit more time than I did when I was first starting, when I was doing everything. Um, so it was kind of on its two feet, but not you know, not where it is today and, and really not in like this amazing spot either. So I was still really actively trying to build that as well. How important is it to delegate when you're building a business? You said you have a finance team now, yeah. you have this team, that team. Huge. Like how important is yeah, it to have it's, faith it's, in the people you have around you? It's huge. And I'm somebody, like, I have trust issues to begin with. So it took me a little bit to like learn and I'm very, I'm not a micromanager, but I like to have my hands in things. And so when I brought on my, my Amazon team, for example, like they do a great job on the Amazon ads and 
at first they were doing things a little bit differently than I was. And so I was like very much like, hey, why are we doing this? What's going on here? But as they start to prove themselves, you give them a little bit more flexibility and leniency on doing what they need to do and what they think is right. Um, and so delegation is massive because it's the only way you're gonna end up scaling because you only have so much time in your day and you just can't do everything. And so there's too many things going on with Wake Up Water right now. I can't you know, do all the supply chain stuff, the marketing, the sales, running Amazon, running the website, fulfilling orders, you know, doing all the books, making sure the books are good. So as you start to scale and you have some money, I'm a big proponent of bringing in people that are smarter than you. So my finance team is way better at finance than I am. And in, so what I think is really interesting is when some people start to grow their business, they immediately start to say, oh, we're making more money, I can pay myself more. I have the other mindset of I don't take any additional money out of the business as we grow. I'm constantly surrounding myself and using that money to bring in talent to help me grow. And I think that's a really important thing because I see it all the time. People will start a business, they'll hit six figures a year, they'll all of a sudden hit seven figures a year and then eight, and they're just like sucking more money out of the business. Whereas my mindset is take what I need out of the business to survive, pay my bills, save a little bit, and then spend the rest on growing the business, bringing in people, marketing, um, so that I think is a is a really big step in growing the business is starting to bring in those people. Elaborate on like bringing the people in. Is yeah. it like when you have these teams, are they full time hires? Are they agencies like partnerships? Yep. Um, and then also like the feeling that you get from like when someone is not doing it how you want it to be yeah, done. Yeah. Yeah. But like in reality, you hired them. You know that they're an expert in their field, and just like seeing that through. Yeah. So. Uh, definitely avoid, I definitely avoid hiring full-time employees when I can, just because there's a lot of hidden costs. You're paying payroll tax, you know, you gotta offer them benefits, a lot of different, you know, costs associated with doing that. And so, you know, the Amazon, that's an agency and that comes, it's nice, it comes with a full team of people, ad buyers, my account executive, who's the person that is kind of the intermediary between the ad buying team and me. We talk, we go over things. There's so many people on that team to help with creative and, and all these different things. So we are able to get a lot of different skill sets by paying what's probably cheaper than a full-time employee. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, the finance team's also, it's an agency. It's more like part-time, you know, fractional people. So we have like a fractional CFO, a fractional accountant, fractional controller. Um, and again, it helps us because we save on it and a lot of those hidden costs. Um, but also you're able to hire way above what you can afford. So if I was hiring, you know, a CFO for, for wake up water, I could only afford to bring in somebody probably, you know, that doesn't have a ton of experience. Now I'm going out and bringing in somebody that has a ton of experience because they can do the work for wake up water because it's still so small in such a, a relatively, you know, short time frame. So it works out for, for both sides. Do you use any of the same staff for um, like Sally and Wake Up Water? We don't currently. We do use some of the same suppliers, so that helped. You know, when we were coming up with Sally, I realized, hey, some of the ingredients are the same, or you know, hey, this supplier also offers this ingredient, so I can leverage some of those relationships, and that's nice because they can get you product quicker because they know you're good for the money, they know you're a good partner, um, and it also typically gives you some payment terms, so they'll say, hey. You know, you can pay us in 30 or 60 days, helps us with our cash flow. Um, but in terms of like the fractional CFO or anything like that, or the ad buying team, nothing with Sully right now. It's still just my brother, myself, and my father um, because I don't want to bring on people until we're at a certain level where we can support that. Like Wake Up Water throws off enough money where we can bring on staff and, and have people help us. Selly's still so early on and it's such a tough industry where we make such little money on every box sold and we're, and we're still not at the scale of a high noon or some of these other brands. Um, so we truthfully just can't afford to do it right now. We, we could, I guess, in theory, but we would rather spend that money on growing the business and marketing versus bringing on somebody to do work that we could be doing anyway. Alcohol's tough. It's brutal, man. It is a brutal, <laughs> brutal space. I mean, I, it, we see, I think there's like a thousand new drink companies come into the market every year and not many of them make it. I mean, I think it's like 90% don't make it past year one or something. And then like, you know, not, you know, 95% are done after our first couple of years. And so I think, uh, you know, it's a really, really tough space. With that being said, the valuations are also crazy. So you'll see brands doing one or $2 million a year and raising at a $25 million yeah. valuation. And you're like, this doesn't make any sense. So there is that trade off. Like there's the short term, like we're not taking money out of the business right now, but I think long term, you know, there could be a nice payout there as well. It's very glamorous too. It, yeah, it's a yeah. glamorous industry that people want to be in. And like yeah, every celebrity wants to get involved in everything. thinks it's really cool. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Hey Siri, stop. <laughs>
What's there he's fuck? listening to us. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that. No, it's it's like it, even in Boston too. Like you see, like I mean, there's people. Every we all know people that have started, you know, hundred percent alcohol brands and yeah, a ton of them. done the whole thing and yeah. raised money or bootstrapped or whatever and tried to get in. And it's like it's tough, but it's like it's great to have something alongside it that's like yeah. kind of helps you keep it going. That helps you learn. Yeah. You're learning from mistakes that you make in another business exactly. and, and adapting. And it makes um, it easier too because that first business now can pay me a little bit. You know, for the first yeah. few years, I was taking nothing out of wake up water. Yeah. And I was doing all these side jobs to make ends meet, you know, to pay my rent. And, uh, you know, I sold my car. I started driving Uber at one point. You know, I was just doing whatever it took. But now that I can pay myself a little bit, that takes a little bit of the financial stress away from it. Whereas if I was just doing Selly and we were, you know, year two, Trying to move products and not making anything, it'd be tough, you know? What's your favorite flavor? The blueberry pomegranate. That's yeah, my that's, that's my go-to. And okay. it's funny, we actually, Boston Magazine actually rated the blueberry pomegranate the best seltzer in Boston. Um, we didn't, like, we didn't even know it was there. It was published in a magazine, and we had some people send it to us, be like, oh, congrats, guys. Um, what was it? What was it, like, up against? Do you want one? It was, uh, yeah, I'll do one. Do Why you want, not? You want the blueberry pomegranate? Yeah, sure. Those, I'll, mango, I'll those mango pineapples, we might have to put in a safe. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're valuable hot commodity. I know, I know. Sell them on the black market. Yeah. Um, but cheers, boys. Do you cheers. Get, do you ever get sick of these? Like, do you ever feel like I can't drink my own drink anymore? It's funny, not really. No. You think I would, but yeah, cheers, boys. You think you think I would? I like the can. I, I really don't. Yeah, thank you. We're going for a little bit of a retro feel for it. No, it's cool. You know, you, these you, are lukewarm though, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's bear fine. with me on this one. My uh, my first impression is the smell. I can smell the blueberries in it. It's very strong. It's like a muffin. Yeah, it's a uh, really good, uh, really good flavor. You know, it's um, funny. It tastes like a vodka soda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's the goal. It's a vodka soda with real fruit juice. Um, so we really uh, are, are eyeing for a product that is super clean, um, that doesn't really have a kind of similar wake up water. It doesn't have a lot of additives in it. It is alcohol though, so it's not as you know healthy as a wake up water. But um, we wanted to create like unparalleled taste without kind of sacrificing on you know adding a bunch of sugar, or artificial ingredients in there. I like it. I like it too. Yeah. Easy. Are you a hockey yeah. guy? Or? So I, I, I'm a fan of hockey, but not like, I never, I, I played when I was really young, but okay. you know, not like a diehard fan, but that is kind of where the name comes from. Right. Selly. I wasn't sure. That's kind of like a yeah. term that hockey players, yeah. hockey slang. They yeah. Pick that up. That was your Selly, bro. Yeah. But, uh, so it's, uh, it, it's interesting. It's, um, you know, we get a lot of that. And uh, my brother, he's, you know, kind of like a stockier kid. He's got like longer hair and people always associate the name and then also his like, you know, persona with hockey. Um, but yeah, we always joke. We're like one day we got to sponsor the bees and, you know, yeah, definitely. it's selling time every, after every goal. You know what I mean? Um, I asked you about the legal loopholes or the legal holes you have to jump through for, you know, energy drinks. You yeah. told me they're none. There must be much more with the liquor brand. Yeah. Talk about the it's, licenses. What yeah. that's like getting approved. That's the one biggest thing with, with the alcohol space. It's, it's brutal. I mean, forget the competition, just the legal loopholes of going through <laughs> it all. Like you have to get your own liquor license. And then what's worse is there's a three tier system. So after prohibition, the government said, look, like alcohol producers cannot ship their own product somebody else needs to do it. And so now you have all these distributors where we have to sell the product to a distributor. The distributor then brings it to a store. And so it's, uh, you oh, know, you can't even sell directly to a store. No, we can't, oh. we, we go to the stores and we, you know, sell the product, sell, but they have to order yeah, through the distributor. Course, course. And so, you know, that hurts our margin. That makes it more difficult. And also when, when you're a young brand, it's a hard time finding a distributor because you gotta remember they're distributing all the massive brands. That's where they make their money. That's all they care about. Now you enter a celly, which, you know, when it's starting out, you, you've no product. Being and if sold. you're not a celebrity or exactly. not. Exactly. Like, They're yeah. like, is this going to work? I'm not going to waste my time, sure. money and effort on a small brand. Like we're going to just focus on the big guys. So there's that. There's also every time you come up with a label or a box, you have to send it to the States to get approval. You have to get your formula approved. Like there's so many things that they go over. What would get like a label or like a box disapproved from the state so there's a lot of different things like for example one you have to like there's all these regulations you got to state like what your product is right on the front of the can oh, so vodka say, like, with real fruit exactly. juice sparkling water and so natural flavors. you know that helps you know the customer but it's also like a legal thing for us like we had to put that and you have to put it in very exact writing um you know you have to put like a, a warning on the label like this uh you know attorney general or attorney uh, attorney uh 
surgeon general about, um, you know, on the back of the can about basically saying, you know, the average analysis of the can, how much, you know, carbs and, and sugars are in it. And also that, you know, hey, it's alcohol. Like, you know, if you have a few of these, like you might not want to operate machinery and things like that. So there's a lot of different just weird things that go into it. And, and that's the one challenging thing is figuring out even what you're supposed to say on it. Like it took us a long time figuring out what do we even have to say? Because these government websites are so archaic and old that, you know, they're not well laid out and you almost are doing research and where I think it should be a lot more simple. And they should just say, hey, this is what you need to put on it and you're good to go. So you're about, what, five years into this journey now? Yeah, about five years in now. Yeah. What? What's next for you? What What is the, the, the long-term plan for you with these brands, yeah. with other brands, your just entrepreneurial path? Yeah, so I think there's like two routes, right? It's like I want to keep continue to build the brands, build them as big as they can possibly be. Um, and if I'm at the point where, you know, it makes sense to maybe start acquiring other brands or maybe starting new brands, line extensions, I'll do that. Um, but my initial thought process is probably build them to the certain point where like a strategic large player in the space buys the, the brand um, and puts it in their portfolio, I'll take, you know, all the learnings, you know, hopefully some financial success and start to invest in smaller brands and help them grow and kind of accelerate their growth because I now know some of the different hurdles you need to get over, different processes you got to go through. So that's kind of the long-term goal I think for myself is either acquire other brands or, you know, eventually sell them and invest in others. What are like, from, from your experience, like doing this, like your a favorite things to do like responsibilities and parts of building but yeah. also like your strong suits yeah i would say the strong suits are probably like the social media analytics behind things so like amazon for example like selling on amazon we've gotten pretty good at like you know selling a lot of products on amazon because that's you know very data driven like we're able to play with the numbers um you know that's a, a, a pretty you know, favorite part of mine. I think uh, another part is like events. Like I just love getting out there, interacting with people, like sharing the product, whether it's wake up water, we're doing a fitness class, like F45 is opening in, C uh, in, in South Boston. So we're kind of partnering with them on some like intro classes. So I get to go there, work out with people, share the product with Selly. I mean, it's the best. I mean, we'll rent out, you know, or work with like Big Night Live or The Grand Memoir or even like a Moxie's or Loco or Hunters in, in South Boston where we get to go have an event or even just go and like talk to people and share the product with people. Like there's nothing better than just connecting with people over a drink. So, you know, I think that's my favorite part and probably where I'm a little bit stronger as well as like being out there and engaging with people. I think where I fall a little short is probably like, you know, maybe like the operations or financial side of things. Like that's something I'm still getting better at and I could definitely use some work. Um, but know, it also seems like done, but that was one of the first things that you delegated yeah, and outsourced exactly. immediately. Exactly. So that's the thing, right? It's like once you get to the point where you can bring in help, find where you're falling short or where you just need a little bit of help and bring people in for those things. So yeah, that's a good catch. That's exactly what we did. Would you still start these brands in 2024 today? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think so. Um, again, it just comes down to like what you're passionate about. Like if I wanted to come up with something that I could make quicker, short term money, it probably wouldn't start a beverage company. Um, but you know, I don't think I'd be as passionate doing like a clothing brand or something like that. I just, I like doing this and, and you know, that's why I wanted to do it. But I would tell anybody if they wanted to start something, pick what you are really, really into and kind of lead with that. Like don't necessarily chase after the short term money of it. Most people listening to this probably are in the Boston area. What are some spots, Selly, Wake Up Water, that they can find them? Yeah, so Wake Up Water is really easy. It's drinkwakeupwater.com okay. uh, and on Amazon as well. Uh, with Selly, we're pretty much all throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire and a, basically every single liquor store. We've been actually having some trouble where, because we're so, so small and undercapitalized that we're having a tough time keeping a lot of liquor stores stocked up. You know, a, a liquor store will take a big drop of product, we'll sell through it, and then it's like scrambling to make sure that they have some stock. So bear with us if, if uh, you know, we're out of stock there. We're also in a lot of the bars, like we're in Moxie's in Seaport, Loco, Hunter's in South Boston. Um, greatest bar by the TD Garden. So a lot of different bars. And if we're not somewhere, we always ask people, please ask for it because that gives the bartenders and the managers there an inclination of like, oh, wow, a lot of people want this product. We should probably order it and bring it in. What's the conversation like with um, bar owners when you're going in there and it's like, hey, I have this seltzer, um, you know, I want you guys to carry it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times they must tell you to kick rocks. Oh, but yeah. What are kind of like the selling points? Why are you better than, you know, White Claw Truly? It's White Claw Truly, Topo Chico and Happy Dad of the yeah. Big Four, right? Yeah. And then High Noon. And High Noon. Know, okay. Yeah. So High Noon right now dominates. Um, 
you're right. I mean, it, it's tough because the bars are especially difficult because they only have so much space. Right. So, you know, they really need to make sure that whatever they bring in, they can sell. So that's kind of why we took our approach of only taking a handful of bars at first, because if we went into a hundred different bars, we would have to be in every single bar helping it sell because people don't know en enough about Selly yet to know that it's going to be at the bar. So it's, you know, they have to like the product. And then it's, you know, hey, look, we're, we're local guys. We're in here all the time anyway. If you take our product, we'll come in and we'll help sell it. Like, we'll tell people about it. We'll get it moving. Um, so they really like that because some of these other big brands, like while, you know, High Noon sells all the time, you know, you might have like a Truly or White Claw that might not sell as well. And they don't have people that live in Boston that are in there helping it sell. So they appreciate that. And at the end of the day, you know, these bar managers are typically really supportive of like local, you know, local people and local brands. So I think playing up the local card, telling them you're going to support them, and then them liking the product are kind of the biggest things. Yeah, you being in there and just like yeah. showing face, bringing people yep. also like that are just going to spend money and like most of the time grab some food or grab you know exactly. another drink or something. It's yeah. like that that helps. Yeah, and we we try to roll pretty deep. The selling you know groups pretty supportive. So you know, and I always tell them I'll, I'll buy them some selling if they <laughs> they come with me. But you know, we have a good group, and so people see that and they're like, oh, this is just like an easy way to get more people in here. Um, you know, it helps us because people are posting about it and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's like a win-win, you know, for the bar too. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming no, through. I, I appreciate you. Is there guys anything else you want to add? No, I, I think, uh, you know, the only thing is, you know, Hey, look, if, if you see us out there, you know, maybe buy a pack. Um, and if you don't want to buy a pack, maybe just tell your friends about it. The word of mouth is huge for the, for both brands. So if you see wake up water, hear about wake up water, hear Sally, see Sally, you know, maybe just tell a friend about it. That would be awesome. And, you know, we're all in it together and hopefully we build these things into something special. Love it. My what? winner is the wake up water. I like that. Yeah, I, let's I go. Went through basically the whole thing. What a wake up um, water mixed into a celly. So that would be a vodka wake up or a celly or, you know, I guess you could call it a, a celly wake up. But yeah, people do that. People put wake up water in alcohol. I can't, you know, vouch for that. I can't advocate <laughs> for that. Uh, you know, drink at your own, at your own risk. But, um, you know, people, it has not that. been tested on humans. <laughs> yeah. I had one buddy, he literally send me Snapchat videos. He'll shotgun a celly, but before he shotguns it, he'll put a pack of wake up water. And I'm like, you're going to be buzzing tonight. <laughs> That's nuts. That's crazy. That's well, I friend. guess you need that, right? Yeah, absolutely. The cult followers. Yeah, so you boys will have to come out with us sometime. We'll have to, Anytime. you know, turn up and, and, and have a day. No doubt. Thank you so much. Thank you boys. I appreciate it. Thank you.